Tonight's speaker is Father Thomas Joseph White, a Dominican friar. He's assistant professor of systematic theology at the Pontifical Academy of the Immaculate Conception at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. Father White has a BA degree from Brown University. He has a MPhil and DPhil in theology from Oxford University and a license in sacred, sacred theology from the Dominican House of Studies. He's the author of Wisdom in the Face of Modernity, a study in modern Thomistic natural theology. Editor of this handsome volume, The Analogy of Being, Invention of the Antichrist or Wisdom of God. Co-editor with uh, James Keating of Divine Impassibility and the Mystery of Human Suffering. Author also of a forthcoming book on metaphysics and Christology titled The Incarnate Lord, a Thomistic Study in Modern Christology. Tonight he will address us on the careful rationality of monotheism, Thomas Aquinas on analogical knowledge of God. Please join me in welcoming Father White. I'd like to thank Father Mankowski for his kind introduction. You know that when Dominicans and Jesuits are companions in arms, that's a powerful thing. So, And um, I'd also like to thank Thomas Levergood and those who are sponsoring the lecture for the invitation to speak. It's really a wonderful uh, privilege in my own mind to speak at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. It's one of those things that exists sort of in your, in your thoughts and then you, you, know, you encounter its reality and it's just lovely. Okay, uh, I have a handout that I think most of you have and I will not, I hope you're relieved to know, read all of those quotes, but they give you some locations for some of the ideas I'm gonna go through, sometimes a little bit rapidly so that you can go back and get rooted in where these things come from in Aquinas and maybe pursue them a bit more. The lecture I have uh, is, uh, it's a longish, it's 45, 50 minutes, and uh, at times I'll read a bit fast. But there'll be time for questions on some of the material. In the, high, in the age of high scholasticism, the summit of philosophical thought was seen to reside in the demonstrative knowledge that we might have of God and in the speculative contemplation of the attributes of God. Properties such as divine simplicity, perfection, goodness, immutability, eternity, and so forth. This medieval vision of philosophy presumes, of course, that we might derive knowledge of God from creatures, positive knowledge that is both demonstrative and, in a certain sense, contemplative. To contemplate God as the highest act of the mind and the summit of the life of the university. But is this claim true? Do creatures bear any relation of similitude to God from which we might perceive truths about God himself? If so, in what way do the ontological characteristics of creatures, their perfections and limitations, allow us or not allow us to speak of what God is and of what God is not? From creatures, how can philosophy offer names for God as a way of entering into the question, I'd like to consider briefly the basic answer offered by Aquinas and some objections to that solution. This sets the stage for thinking more deeply about how we might name God philosophically. In the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas broaches the topic quite early on in question four in the Prima Pars, article three, where he asks whether any creature can be like God. There he makes a fundamental distinction between what he calls univocal agents and non-univocal or equivocal agents. Let us be clear here. We are speaking of univocity and equivocity as something that pertains not only to our logical or linguistic designations about reality, how we name reality, but also as, something pro as of something proper to the reality itself, characterizing the very being of things. Univocal agents, for Aquinas in this passage at least, are those who transmit that form or essence of being that they themselves possess to the realities they act upon. Their very natures are transmitted to the other. So a parent communicates human life to his or her child, and both the parent and the child possess the same, 
essentially identical to human nature. Both are equally human, univocally speaking. The parent is a univocal cause of the child. By contrast, the light and warmth of the sun do not make the creatures of the earth to be sunlight or to partake as such of the processes of fusional reaction that are characteristic of the nature of a star. They do, however, transmit effects of the sun from which there accrues a certain likeness between the light and warmth of the earth and that of the sun itself. It's less palpable uh, today given the weather, which shows that it's really not univocal uh, causality. And so it would be equivocal to say that the earth is a sun because the two are not of the same species. But we can, Aquinas says, attribute a likeness not of species but of genus to the two entities invoking a commonly shared quality. The earth and the sun are both warm bodies, albeit of specifically different kinds and to differing degrees, but in a common genus, the genus of the warm body. But he says in the same article, God is not a generic kind of reality among others, a being among other beings, as we will have occasion to return to later. So how might we speak of, of God? And here Aquinas posits a famous theorem. I'm quoting him. It's a rather long quote. If there is an agent not contained in any genus, its effects will still more distantly reproduce the form of the agent. Not, that is, so as to participate in the likeness of the agent's form according to the same specific or generic formality, but only according to some sort of analogy, as existence is common to all. In this way, all created things, so far as they are beings, are like God as the first and universal principle of all being. God is essential being, ens per essentiam, whereas other things are beings by participation. So, for St. Thomas, the philosopher is capable of a rational consideration of the attributes of God by recourse to a process of analogical naming. Okay, so that's just to introduce Aquinas' basic idea. Objections. Historically, there are positions that take Aquinas' understanding of the analogical naming of God to be problematic by way of mutually opposed extremes. For some, his theory of naming God is too weak and fails to offer a sufficiently strong sense of names that can carry over from creatures to God in precisely the same sense, that's to say univocally. This argument is that we need univocal predication to safeguard authentic knowledge of God, and it is most famously espoused by Duns Scotus. Today it's cha championed by some analytical philosoph analytic philosophers of religion, such as perhaps most notably w Richard Swinburne. In his book, The Coherence of Theism, Swinburne offers a univocalist account of God's attributes in which he ascribes to God such properties as beliefs, real relations to creatures, existence in time, and being a substance, presumably in a larger genus with other substances. These are just examples, but they are all ascriptions that Thomists would find to be anthropomorphic. For others, on the other end of the spectrum, Aquinas' theory of analogical naming is too strong or too ambitious and fails to acknowledge the radical limitations of all our attempts to describe or prescribe notions for the divine, even when an analogical distance is acknowledged. The radical equivocity of all our names for God recalls to us the truth of the unspeakable and incomprehensible transcendence of God, the divine darkness. This is the view, one might argue, of Heidegger, who does build upon the Kantian prohibition of classical arguments for the existence of God and who, la who labels all such arguments, insofar as they are ascribable to scholastic thinking, onto theology. Today, this view is most eloquently represented by Jean-Luc Marion. He appeals to Dionysius the Areopagite's radical apophaticism, or negative language about God, in order to develop a, phenomenolo a phenomenological ontology of divine love and the consideration of the creation as gift. Marion wishes to approach the mystery of God by means of the philosophical mystery of the goodness or givenness of reality without recourse to a causal argumentation derived from a metaphysical consideration of the being of things. He gives a rhetorically potent label to this latter form of, refre of reflection, let's say the causal argumentation approach to God through metaphysical ontology, especially when it's used to speak of God, that moniker being his famous phrase, conceptual idolatry. 
And in his early work, Marion suggests this description could be given even to the work of Aquinas himself. As some of you may know, he's backed away from that idea about Aquinas in subsequent publications. In the face of these criticisms, the fundamental question is to speak of God rightly and well. The intricacies of the threefold Dionysian VA are not in vain. And even when we do so, do so speak, we do so signify God in what he is, but only in a non-comprehensive and apophatic manner, as speaking of a mystery that infinitely surpasses us, even as it is in some real sense intellectually accessible to us. Third, the philosophical articulation of names for God need not be a mere search for fool's gold, based upon intellectual false hope to be struck down by the intellectual iconoclasts of Maimonides and his ilk. On the contrary, the speculative impulse to seek to understand something of God is the most noble aspiration of the human intellect and is the place that our mind might also naturally encounter the philosophical question, itself philosophically unanswerable, of the possibility of divine self-disclosure, that is to say of divine revelation. Recently, a contemporary theologian, one who has for a long time been a noteworthy Bardian, but is gradually leaning towards Thomism, was overheard to have said that the, university cannot, that the university cannot survive without theology, but that theology can survive without the university. His point was in part that we should envisage ways to communicate sophisticated and spiritual forms of Christian theology outside of the ordinary channels of the discourse of the now increasingly secularized university. But of course, it's the first statement that is the more provocative, that the university only really has its deepest unity and meaning in dependency upon the unifying light of theology. This, of course, is the vision of the medieval university applied in the heart of the contemporary world and employed to diagnose the crisis of the postmodern fracturing of the distinct scientific discourses in contemporary academic culture. Without a theological unity, the center does not hold. But what is said here provocatively of theology is perhaps even more certainly true with regards to philosophy. For it is above all philosophy that gives unity to all other forms of knowledge and brings them all into one ultimate form of organized discourse. And without this, the authentic universality of thought in the university is endangered. And the point is, can philosophy really do this without talking about God and the attributes of God, the first principle and final end of all things? And he alone, in whose light we grasp the, we grasp the meaning of all lesser created lights, Modern secularized philosophy departments are busy working to protect themselves from the aggressive claims of neuroscience on the one hand and the relativizing hermeneutical stances of postmodern literature on the other. Philosophy is often seen trying to reassert its right to exist or its relevance as it stands between an empiricist reductionism on the one hand and a rationalist relativism on the other. But the way of reassertion of philosophy's irreducible splendor and unifying role, even in the heart of the contemporary academy, comes in part through the reassertion of philosophy's capacity to seek God and to speak rationally and truthfully about God. It is this that gives ultimate light to the unity of all natural learning, and in this task, the multi multiform reflections of Thomas Aquinas on the analogical naming of God are of an inestimable, uh, an inestimable resource they are one, even today, of perennial value. Thank you very much. About whether there's analogical predication vis-a-vis -vis the world to God, but you have to already treat this kind of intra-worldly analogical uh, attribution, whether you think that's valid or not. And it's very hard to deny it, but if you admit it, then you admit an analogy of being. When Aquinas takes up this idea from Aristotle, he explicitly relates it to his understanding of the analogical significations, not only of the good, which Aristotle treats explicitly, but he expands it to treat of being, truth, and unity as well. I've given you in the passage cited uh, on the handout one very clear example where he makes this kind of expansion. These notions being truth, unity, goodness, 
often referred to as transcendentals, are called such because they transcend or span across the multiple categories of being. And so each of them can only be denoted, according to Aquinas, in analogical ways. So the being of a substance, such as being a human, is distinct from the being of a property, such as a quality, like being musical. The unity of an operation, like one act of sight, a unified act of sight, is different from the unity of a place, like a parking lot. One parking lot, which parking lot? That one there. Truth statements about what is the case that concerns, say, relations, that is my father to whom I'm related, are different from truth statements that concern passions. He is currently undergoing sur surgery. Both these statements could be true. In short, the transcendental notions, being, unity, truth, goodness, are both grounded in the multiplicity of the ontological character of reality and are said analogically of that reality. The upswing of this fact is twofold. First, for Aquinas, it follows necessarily, not just for God, but even for ordinary, you might say, banal realities that surround us, there are certain non-trivial features of these realities that we cannot speak of in purely univocal terms. And to do so would represent a serious misunderstanding of the structure of reality, as well as the logic of realistic predication. As Kajetan rightly noted against Scotus, and as Joshua Hochschild has studied recently in some detail in his work on this subject, the significations of the good for Aquinas take on their common meaning or offer a readily identifiable common core only in an analogically unified way, which means that notions that are transcendental, like goodness or being, are intrinsically analogical notions, not univocal ones. You cannot define them except analogically. Goodness, then, for St. Thomas, can be defined in a unified fashion as that perfection of finality or actuation by which a thing or property becomes in some way appetable or desirable, for we desire the good. But, the ontologic, but ontologically, the realization of this perfection takes on different forms and only appears mysteriously in and through a diversity of forms. The perfection of a degree of human love simply is formally, specifically, distinct from, or generically distinct from the perfection of the art of playing the violin. So we might desire the good, and the good might be a perfection or actu a perfect, a perfect actuation of the subject in some respect, but it's different if that perfection is an actuation qua friendship, qua uh, quality of being able to play the violin, qua a quantity, like a good amount of some, of, uh, uh, money or something like that, or if it's a relation, a good set of relations, I have a good family, that kind of thing. To try to reduce this commonality to generic form is to rob the notion of the good of its intrinsic flexibility and to obscure the, per the perception of the irreducibly ontologically complex realization of the good. So second, we can already conclude, even from talking about intra-worldly realizations of being or of the good, that God cannot be signified univocally or under the sign of a common form shared with creatures, no matter how carefully qualified. For, as Aquinas notes in the Summa Contra Gentiles, Book 1, Chapter 32, which I think I've given you. Oh, no, sorry, he argues it before the passage I've given you. If the goodness of God could be signified, for instance, in univocal continuity with goodness as it's realized in this world, then goodness would have, to, would have a formal constitution. It would be a species of thing, or something specific common to a multiplicity of realities. Why? Well, because to, to signify God univocally, you'd first need a univocal notion of the good, so you'd have to ground it in something specific that is just qua species the good. But if it were a given species or genus, then it would be applicable to all the other genre or species of beings, but, uh, sorry, it would not be applicable to all the other genre or species of beings, but only to one. And God is not in any one genus of being, as Aquinas has also argued coherently in Summa Contra Gentiles, Book 1, Chapter 25. For if God were in one genus of being, of, in the created order, for example, he would be a subsidiary, a subsidiary member of the larger collection of beings who participate in the being common to all creatures and would not be the author of every genus of existent realities. He would be a being among beings, as Heidegger had feared. Just because God exists, therefore, as the author of all created being, and therefore of all genre of beings, he cannot partake univocally of a specific 
or generic attribute in common with other similar kinds of realities. Likewise, if goodness did pertain to God univocally, it would be applicable to other realities only metaphorically. Why is this? But because God alone would be good, and the other realities would be so only equivocally speaking, as in some kind of Manichaean view of reality. Or it would be the inverse. Some species of created reality known to be good univocally could alone be designated as the good, and God could only be said to be, uh, to be, said to be so equivocally in comparison with that reality. It is as if we were to say, only the lion is specifically good in his species. The lion is the form of the good. And everything else is good insofar as it resembles the lion. So God, or Teresa of Calcutta, or one's closest friend, may be said to be good insofar as they are like the lion, but to say that God is a lion is a metaphor, since there are features of the essence of being a lion that cannot be attributed to God. For example, God is the cause of every genus of being, is himself without matter or dependence upon physical causality of any kind. This differentiates him from an animal such as a lion. But just as the lion's nature is not capable of signifying God per se, because God is not material, so neither could God be good if the lion were formally goodness itself. If the lion were identified, if goodness were identified with any particular created essence, this would follow. You could make a similar argument with an angel. If you say only, the only thing that's good is the angel, or the only thing that's good is man, you'd always run into the same problems. Insofar God, as God does not partake of that species or essence, God is not essentially good, and since goodness just is a certain kind of essence, God is only said to be good metaphorically. So the irony is that by beginning with the insistence on univocity in order to maintain continuity between our creaturely significations and God, Scotus is worry. We have to get enough formally in goodness in this world that we can transpose it onto God clearly. If we do that, we end up with an implicit turn towards radical equivocity that makes it impossible to signify God except by way of creaturely anthropomorphism. On the one hand, God is the lion, God has beliefs, God exists in time, or by mere metaphor. They aren't that different, really. I mean, it is somewhat metaphorical to say God exists in time or God has real relations to the world. If you say God has real relations to the world, that means the essence of God is somehow, is somehow mutated by what happens in this world. So he's alterable based on what's going on in creatures. But that means the door's pretty open to a wide array of what are classically considered metaphorical descriptions. So one could end up like Professor Swinburne ascribing to God changing beliefs, existence in time, or a host of other uh, arguably anthropomorphic properties. And is this not something akin to what Mario deems conceptual idolatry? In reality, university theorists, to the extent that they avoid the problem of, the, uh, uh, to the extent that they rightly af af avoid this form of problematic thinking, are making implicit use of purely analogical concepts to discuss the divine names, at least insofar as they speak truthfully of God. So I would argue when they say they're doing univocal thinking when it's working, they're actually using a, a kind of qualified analogical form of thinking, or so one might argue. So now let me switch over to Proclus. To this point, we have considered the ways that transcendental properties or names such as being or goodness are ascribed analogically across the horizontal trajectory of created being, so to speak, of intra-creaturely reality, the categorical modes of being in this world. However, there's another more ultimate sense in which uh, they must be said analogically as well of the first cause of creation. This is not saying talking about the goodness of, say, a quality versus a quantity, or the goodness of the lion versus the goodness of the human being. This is now talking about the goodness of creatures, you might say transcendent, in a transcendent way, vis-a-vis -vis the goodness of God, the creator. That, that depends on making the passage intellectually from creatures to God. And here it's useful to consider briefly Aquinas' criticisms of Neoplatonist divine naming and the way he interprets Proclus' Book of Causes as well as Dionysius' divine names in light of these criticisms. In relating his understanding of divine names to the work of Proclus in the Book of Causes, Aquinas wishes to refute any notion that God is simply to be identified with the common being or goodness that stands at the heart of reality. Everything that exists in creation is in some way good or exists, but God is not that existence or that goodness. 
In doing so, he makes clear his rejection of Neopl uh, Neoplatonist emanationist schemas, which posit an underlying unity between the world and God, or seem to. Rather, what one must rightly do is appeal to the notion of God as the transcendent and unique author of the common being and goodness of created reality. It is this idea, which he finds in Proclus, that he does appreciatively receive from the Neoplatonic heritage. God alone subsists of himself, and in his simplicity is identical with his own existence and goodness. By contrast, all created realities participate in existence and goodness that they receive from God, and they do so only insofar as God is the cause and origin of all that proceeds from him. So see in this respect Aquinas' commentary on the Proposition 4 in the Book of Causes which states, Proclus states, the first of created things is being, and no created thing is before it. And it's sort of the primary effect of God in the creation is being. Which he interprets by recourse to Proposition 138 of the same book, of all the principles which participate in the divine character, the first and highest is being. Consequently, Aquinas says, there results a similitude or analogy in the order of being between creatures and God that is derivative from this unique transcendent form of causality, a form of causality that is proper to God alone. God alone creates all that exists, and so the creation resembles him, but only analogically as an entirely unique kind of cause. So now we're talking about anal anal analogical uh, resemblance in a, in a very different way. You might, call you might call it vertical or transcendent ascriptions based on the creature-creator uh, dependence, the cre dependence of creatures on the creator. How then should we speak about the analogy between creatures and God? Here is the key to divine naming, the process that undergirds our speculative contemplation of the divine attributes. On this point, to uh, tease out what he's claiming to see in Proclus, Aquinas appropriates the thought of Dionysius the Areopagite and employs the latter cautiously to interpret Proclus's ideas about divine causality in a distinctly Christian monotheistic way. St. Thomas argues that just because there is a unique analogical causal resemblance that stems from creation, so the human mind may ascend from the perfections found in creatures to the analogical consideration of the attributes of God. This form of thinking, however, must be threefold, the famous Dionysian threefold via, First, because creatures exist and are good and so forth, God can be said to exist and to be good analogically per viam causalitatis, by way of causality, insofar as God is the cause of creatures, their perfections must resemble him. If they have being or if they are good, then they must have being and be good, then he must have being and be good as the cause of them, yet in a more perfect way as the cause is greater than the effects. Secondly, however, we must just as soon affirm negatively, per viam remotionis or negationis, that God is not existent or good in the way creatures are, and so his divine essence is utterly incomprehensible and unknown. We name him in darkness. Aquinas gives some approbation to the Dionysian claim that God does not exist in any way that creatures exist, at least, for the cause utterly transcends the effects. And yet we also, lastly, can and must affirm that God is existent and good per viam eminentiae, by way of preeminence. For whatever the unknown and unknowable existence and goodness of God are, they are superabundant and exceed in perfection anything we can or do know in this world. Notice two things about this famous procedure. First of all, it elicits from the intelligence a constructive response a philosophical reading regarding the project of divine naming that is both rational and nuanced, which terminates in a positive form of knowledge. I'm arguing here a little bit against Gilson and Certilange. The mind is invited to affirm of God certain perfections that it must in turn also qualify negatively as well as super eminently. The negative qualifications build upon and perfect a fundamentally cataphatic or positive set of significations. What you're doing in divine naming for Aquinas is not merely tearing down all the problematic human ascriptions to God by a merely uh, negative, apophatic form of language, but you are ultimately building up a way to ascribe uh, something positive to God vis-a-vis -vis what God is in himself. God truly is simple, good, wise, eternal, immutable, and so on. And in ruminating on such things, we speak truly of God. The life of the intellect is thus carried over in darkness, as it were, toward a light that is hidden, yet whose hidden richness and intellectual attraction 
is divined through the search for the truth about our ontological origins. I mean, it's like a God is like a kind of, uh, you know, it's like a polar star you know, leading the mind on the horizon of uh, navigation toward its final home, its destination. But it it really only perceives him through the veil of creatures indirectly, and so ascribes real uh, truth to God and knows something contemplatively about what God is, but only in a very indirect way, and in a highly qualified way. Against Swinburne, this model of divine naming is both analogical and adequate. That is to say, it speaks coherently and truly of God as he is in himself, but without falling into the anthropomorphisms of univocity. Second, this procedure seems to place our conceptual gaze upon God at a twofold distantiation from anything like the conceptual idolatry that Marian would seek to ward off. For on the one hand, even univocal perfections that we attribute to human beings, such as wisdom, we might say univocally all human beings have some wisdom, that cannot be attributed to God in the way categorical, categorical properties are attributed to other persons, even univocally. For God is not wise by way of a quality that is attributed to his substance as in a human person, but due to his simplicity, God simply is his wisdom. This, so it's not a quality of his being. I mean, it's just what God is. Essentially, this means, however, that to say that God is wise is absolutely true, but in also it's, it's also in some real sense incomprehensible. That God is wise is something we know to be the case, but what the divine wisdom is remains unknown. The mind rests in a positive intellectual judgment then, albeit indirect and analogical, of something that pertains truly to God. God is wise, and the mind can rest in this truth, but this is also a rest as in darkness. In the last section of this paper, let us compare aspects of Aquinas' thought on divine naming with that of Maimonides. Maimonides died just a generation before St. Thomas began teaching. You know that he read uh, Guide for the Perplexed and talks about him reverently as Rabbi Moses and uh, makes a, a pretty profound use of Moses, Maimonides um, in his writings. Like Aquinas, Maimonides offered only a, posteri a posteriori arguments for the existence of God, arguments derived from um, effects of God, indirectly attempting to discover God as a, as a cause of those effects. He is wary of any direct ideational intuitions of the divine as we find in the ontological argument. Maimonides and Aquinas are allies against the dangerous meanderings of Anselm, against which wise souls should fortify themselves. Rather, he seeks to derive from the transient and finite entities of this world we perceive, considered as effects, knowledge of the necessary existence of a transcendent cause of the world, a creator who exists without ontological change or limitation of power. So far, so good. Nevertheless, for Maimonides, such argumentation is not intended to terminate in any form of positive contemplation or consideration of the attributes or names of God, but only in what we might call a radically apophatic form of equivocity. God cannot be named from this world except negatively. Maimonides, Maimonides is very explicit about the fact that he's going uh, after a coherent theory of equ equivocal naming of God. That's a reading of him, but it's a a reading that he, he invites in many ways. Famously, Maimonides um, claims that divine names can be interpreted in two ways. When we speak of God's goodness or wisdom and so forth, there's two ways to understand what we're doing. First, they may signify not what God is in himself, but only likenesses of effects derived from God with effects produced by creatures. So, for instance, to say that God is wise is to say that God is the cause of beings that are themselves wise, and that he acts through his effects as does one who is wise. It's sort of like saying God is wise just and only insofar as he creates realities that are themselves wise. However, uh, this does not entail that we might properly attribute to God wisdom in and of himself. Maimonides purposefully affirms the opposite. Secondly, to attribute to God a name is to affirm only that the negation of that name cannot be ascribed to God. This is a funny turn of thought. So, for example, to say that God is living is only to say that we cannot ascribe to God 
the mode of, pro- of being proper to non-living things. You can't say, God is not alive, God is dead. You can't say that. That's what you mean when you say God is living. You only mean you can't make those negative ascriptions. You, you can negate the, the contrary prescriptions. While Maimonides does clearly affirm some kind of speculative demonstrative, some, while he does affirm some form of speculative demonstrative knowledge of God, his philosophy foreshadows in certain respects the thinking of Immanuel Kant. Our demonstrations of the existence of God amount to something akin to a heuristic exercise in rehearsing the possibility of meaning in the universe, but they allow us to say nothing of God in himself. The potential idolatry of the Gentile philosophers is displaced in this Jewish monotheistic way of thinking by a practical study of the moral law, a turn toward the primacy of practical intellect in the wake of speculative apophaticism. This, at any rate, is one way to read Kant and Maimonides in light of one another, and it is a reading of some uh, influence among modern Orthodox Jewish intellectuals deeply influenced by Kant's treatment of the religious limitations of speculative reason, figures such as Joseph Soloveitchik and David Novak. Aquinas offers a number of points of response to Maimonides' arguments. His simplest and strongest argument is the following. If all our language concerning God were simply utterly equivocal, we would be incapable of saying anything about God at all, whether positive or negative, even by way of demonstration. I mean, if you really go after all analogical knowledge of God, you're actually going to undermine the demonstrations. This is a longer quote from Aquinas. All our knowledge of God is taken from creatures, so that if there were agreement in name alone... We would know nothing of God save some empty words with nothing to underwrite them. It would also follow that all the demonstrations concerning God advanced by the philosophers would be sophistical. That's really interesting. They would, I mean, he means sophistical. He means something technical. They'd be a kind of rhetorical sophistry. God talk would be a kind of sophistry. I'm going to come back to this. For example, if it were said, if it were said that whatever is in potency is reduced to act by a being in act, and from this it were concluded that God is being in act, since all things are brought into existence by him, there would be a fallacy of equivocation. You won't, uh, you won't get the middle term in the argument, because at some point what you mean by act in this world and what you mean by act when, when you apply it to God will be equivocal in relation to one another. You won't get the analogical proportion there to be able to make the transfer in the argument. So the argument falls through. We cannot speak truly of the fact that God is pure act if there isn't the possibility of analogical designations of God. Likewise, he argues, if God is spoken of from his effects only by comparison with the effects of creatures, like God has created wise human beings, and that's all we mean when we say God is wise, and we don't mean something about God in himself, then we may say that God is fire and that he cleanses us like fire cleanses physically or that he's wise because he creates order just as wise persons are the source of order in human dealings. But this criteria is so thin, so minimal, that it allows us to equate the application of terms such as fire and wisdom to God with equal and undifferentiated validity. If I say metaphorically God is a fire and I say analogically God is wise, well that differentiation between metaphor and analogy falls apart if you move towards a thoroughly Maimonidean theory of divine predication. In short, if Maimonides is correct, there is no differentiation possible between rigorously analogical names for God, such as divine simplicity, goodness, wisdom, and so forth, and the merely metaphorical terms such as fire, husband, lion, and so forth. Again, if there were no difference between saying that God is alive and saying that God is not a non-living thing, then there would be no difference between saying God is not alive and saying that God is a lion. For, um, sorry, God is not not alive and saying that God is a lion. For a lion is not a non-living thing. The negative criteria alone would be too permissive, too permeable. So everything that you could negate something of, that you could negate of God, would seemingly be something you could also attribute to God positively, which is going to leave a lot of things attributable to God that we probably don't want to, to do or to, to, to give. The differentiations between uh, God and creatures must be identified not only through the elaboration of purely negative differences, but also through the articulation of positive 
differentiations between creatures and between creatures and God. The analogy of being among creatures and the analogy of being between creation and the creator. Aquinas' responses to Maimonides predict in interesting ways consequences of radical equivocity theory in our own time. They show prefigurations of the kind of postmodernist forms of divine naming that we see arise in the wake of Kant and Heidegger. If we relegate the project of divine naming to the purely equivocal, the philosophical rationality of the, of the Judeo-Christian tradition necessarily becomes intrinsically unstructured, or at least unstructured in its connectedness with the natural capacities of the human intellect to name that which exists in any ordinary natural way. Our discourse about God loses its grounding in our more proximate and logically prior forms of explanation and demonstration. Consequently, we can no longer justify sufficiently what we say of God philosophically and why so. Speculative reason consequently has little to contribute regarding what we might or might, or might not say regarding God. The process of divine, na of divine naming thus descends into a field where metaphor and analogy stand shoulder to shoulder and become indifferentiated. I'm thinking here, not without some respect, for the glory of the Lord, Volume 1, in Balthazar, and, and a lot of things that go on in the Trinitarian uh, and Christological dereliction theology of Balthazar, where metaphor and analogy seem to be overlapping in some rather striking, fascinating, uh, but also potentially speculatively frustrating ways. If the human mind cannot really distinguish metaphorical and properly analogical descriptions for God, God is a vine, God is eternally good, then two possibilities emerge. One is that divine naming becomes an exercise in what I would call an insufficiently structured form of intuitive description which merges images, univocal names, and analogies all jumbled together without sufficient discrimination or rigorous justification. We see this arguably in the writings on the divine in the late Heidegger, in Marion's philosophy of God, and in thinkers like Bart and Balthazar in their very potent but also very, I think, problematic theories of, say, divine obedience, divine suffering. You get a kind of theological rhetoric uh, which has a deep, a deep ontological intuition, so there's no question, but where it's not always parsed sufficiently, that kind of rhetoric, for, uh, in terms of when you're speaking with a potentially problematic metaphorical set of ascriptions and when you're using things in a properly analogical form of way. And many of the metaphors are recuperable. Many of Balthazar's rhetorical metaphorical moves are very beautiful and recuperable, but they would be understood differently if you understood them rigorously as metaphors. I mean, if you think the Son is eternally obedient to the Father in his very deity, I mean, do you mean that properly, as Bart says he does, as Balthazar seemingly does as well, or do you mean that metaphorically, in which case it's a potentially enriching metaphor, but needs to be qualified. The other possibility is that divine naming is interpreted as the exercise, as, as the merely, you might say, whimsical rhetorical exercise of the author, as Aquinas says, a sophistical and arbitrary, and I would add arbitrary, imposition of discourse by the will of power. Who gets to name God authoritatively? Philosophical reason can't say. So who controls the discourse? So then the name of God has to be the subject of the never-ending deconstructionist critique that seeks to explain why or why not certain metaphors or names are, are being used, which are oppressive or liberating in given cultural and political contexts. This is the intellectual backdrop to the religious pluralism paradigm that we see that's emergent where it's very important to challenge the received notions of the Western monotheistic tradition by alternative models or metaphors of divine naming. You find it in certain feminist forms of critical skepticism with regards to the classical monotheistic tradition. Um, and these, you find them, these kinds of ideas prevalent in, well, they used to be prevalent in contemporary religious studies departments. I think that they've been driven out by a more purely sociological brand of thinking. Uh, even, even this kind of more contemporary theology seems to have a, a, a limited shelf life in the contemporary religious studies departments, at least in many of them. How to adjudicate between either of these options, then, it would seem to me to be impossible. 
unless we were first to solve the speculative problem that lies behind their mutual development. You're going to end up with a perpetual uh, dialectic, you might say, between Heidegger and Feuerbach, or between Balthazar and Elizabeth Johnson, something like that. A last but not unimportant comparison of Aquinas and Maimonides should be mentioned, I'm, I'm finishing now, with regards to the divine name given in Exodus 3.14, 3.15. And here I want to talk about divine revelation. The name of God in his singularity given in Exodus 3.15, the Lord, the Tetragrammaton, is uttered under the uh, Greek, in the Greek Septuagint, is uttered under the euphemism of the term Kyrios, which we use as Lord in English. It seems to be interpreted in meaning or, uh, or explicated by Exodus itself in th Exodus 3.14, the verse before, with a theological gloss, I am he who is, or perhaps I am the one who will be. Aquinas, when he comments on these two divine names, there's really two divine names there, Exodus 14 and 15, follows Maimonides in the Guide for the Perplexed, as well as Origen and Jerome, in distinguishing between the Tetragrammaton from 3.15 and I am he who is, in Exodus 3.14, as Aquinas interprets the Hebrew, as distinct divine names. Nevertheless, Aquinas also interprets the names as inseparable and mutually related in his metaphysical exegesis in the Prima Pars of the Summa question, 13, Article 9, and Article 11. He identifies the Tetragrammaton with the divine name that signifies the incommunicability of the divine nature in its individuality. Analogous to the way in speaking about other human beings, a singular name signifies the incommunicability of the individual human being, like Paul or Rebecca. When you use a name like that, you're just talking about this individual here, who is no other, who is incommunicable, according to, say, a nature. That's what he thinks the Tetragrammaton signifies with regards to God. This kind of naming of the individuality of God disclosing himself personally contrasts with the name God, which signifies the nature, deity. There's a fam famous story about Elizabeth Anscombe speaking to a priest, and um, they were arguing about whether God is a, a proper name or a, a common name. And the priest was saying that God is a proper name, like Rebecca or Paul. And she said, no, it's a common name. He said, well, how could you use a common name to address someone personally? And she said, oh, priest, you are so stupid. <laughs> and Aquinas thinks, so God means deity. When we say, oh, God, and we pray to him, we say, oh, deity. And the name he who is which signifies, uh, he thinks, signifies the perfection of God as ipsum esse subsistence, subsistent being in itself, the esse of God. So he's lining things up. You've got the tetragrammaton, which designates the individuality of God personally. You've got God, which designates the deity, the nature of God. And you've got uh, 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 he who is, I am he who is, which designates the esse of God, the subsistent existence of the deity. Although these signifying terms are diverse, their multiplicity is derived from our human manner of knowing God based upon terms drawn from creatures, creatures that are themselves complex. Earlier on in question three, he's already made clear that in material creatures, there's a real distinction between individuality and nature, as well as between essence and existence. In us, these things are all really distinct. To be Paul is different from being the human being, or a human being, and being human, uh, the existence of this human being is different from the nature of this human being. But in God, there's no real distinction between nature and individual, or essence and existence, because God is utterly simple. Therefore, while we may rightly designate God in these various senses, as existence, deity, or individual, under these diverse terms, in their ultimate ontological ground, they signify he who is absolutely simple, and by consequence, the multiplicity of terms can be seen only as complementary and interrelated within a larger biblical and metaphysical framework of apophatic and cataphatic approaches to naming God. In short, when we say God is he who is, or God is the divine name, the Lord, or God is this singular personal God, we are saying three different things and signifying God in three different ways as existence itself, as he who has the divine nature, in his personal irrepeatable singularity. But these three are in God himself truly one. The point of this foray into Exodus is to underscore that Aquinas thinks that the philosopher, qua philosopher, 
can identify a certain analogy even for the naming of God in his revealed singular personal individuality. That's not to say that the philosopher can derive knowledge of God as revealed in Exodus, of course. But the philosopher can at least conceive of the possibility of giving a personal name to God if God discloses a personal name to him as we give the name Paul or Rebecca to another person we meet. At the same time, however, due precisely to the apophatic and indirect form of our natural knowledge and naming of God, the awareness or knowledge of who God is personally in himself, we know, Aquinas says, to be utterly inaccessible to us. Consequently, while we can speak with Maimonides of the philosophical enigma or mystery of the individual name of God, of his personal identity, this is something that is not naturally disclosed to us. You know, philosophically, you can think about the fact that God has a personal identity, analogically speaking, and he could, in principle, disclose himself to the world. That won't get you a disclosure. We stand naturally upon a precipice of darkness looking out into the divine possibility, the possibility that God should, from the other side of the gulf of unknowing, address us personally as a thou, as he did to Moses in the desert, as I am he who is as he did for Christians in the human flesh of Christ, the God-man. As Jesus says in the Gospel of St. John, invoking the divine name, for when you have lifted me up upon the cross, then you will know that I am. Sinai and Golgotha speak the divine name to us in a new and henceforth unknown way to communicate to us the singularity and identity of he who is, of he who approaches us personally through the encounter of revelation. But even within the realm of philosophical divine naming alone, we do have a certain analogy from which to anticipate, not historically, not genealogically, but merely logically and conceptually, this pure possibility of reason, that of the personal disclosure of God's individual singularity in and through experiential contact. I only mean to say here that after God has revealed himself to us, we can think about the philosophical rationality of that possibility. Not to say that we could work out the philosophical rationality of the possibility as a temporal prelude to his revealing himself to us. And there's a world of difference between those two ideas. What might we conclude from these reflections? First, that the analogical use of language does not derive from the arbitrary imposition of a rhetorical strategy of conceptual irenicism. We're not just talking about analogy because there's some people out there talking about uh, equivocity and other people out there about talking about univocity, and it's always good to be in the moderate middle. To be realistic, we are required to speak analogically about existence, unity, and goodness of created reality. So says the Thomist, there just is no other way. This discourse entails a process of conceptual unlearning and relearning of the range of meanings of various terms so as to come to an analogically unified grasp of the ontological complexity of reality. Reality just is diverse and complex ontologically, and so analogical naming just is the right way to speak about the structure of things. Second, the causality of God is unlike any other, such that when we speak of God, we are necessarily obliged to qualify or purify our language at various removes and by a relatively ornate, intricate process of speculative reflection so that we might speak of God rightly and well. The intricacies of the threefold Dionysian VA are not in vain. And even when we do so, do so speak, we do so signify God in what he is, but only in a non-comprehensive and apophatic manner, as speaking of a mystery that infinitely surpasses us, even as it is in some real sense intellectually accessible to us. Third, the philosophical articulation of names for God need not be a mere search for fool's gold, based upon intellectual false hope to be struck down by the intellectual iconoclasts of Maimonides and his ilk. On the contrary, the speculative impulse to seek to understand something of God is the most noble aspiration of the human intellect and is the place that our mind might also naturally encounter the philosophical question, itself philosophically unanswerable, of the possibility of divine self-disclosure, that is to say of divine revelation. Recently a contemporary theologian, one who has for a long time been a noteworthy bardian but is gradually leaning towards Thomism was overheard to have said that the university cannot that the university cannot survive without theology, but that theology can survive without the university. 
His point was in part that we should envisage ways to communicate sophisticated and spiritual forms of Christian theology outside of the ordinary channels of the discourse of the now increasingly secularized university. But of course, it's the first statement that is the more provocative, that the university only really has its deepest unity and meaning in dependency upon the unifying light of theology. This, of course, is the vision of the medieval university applied in the heart of the contemporary world and employed to diagnose the crisis of the postmodern fracturing of the distinct scientific discourses in contemporary academic culture. Without a theological unity, the center does not hold. But what is said here provocatively of theology is perhaps even more certainly true with regards to philosophy. For it is above all philosophy that gives unity to all other forms of knowledge and brings them all into one ultimate form of organized discourse. And without this, the authentic universality of thought in the university is endangered. And the point is, can philosophy really do this without talking about God and the attributes of God, the first principle and final end of all things? And he alone, in whose light we grasp the, we grasp the meaning of all lesser created lights, Modern secularized philosophy departments are busy working to protect themselves from the aggressive claims of neuroscience on the one hand and the relativizing hermeneutical stances of postmodern literature on the other. Philosophy is often seen trying to reassert its right to exist or its relevance as it stands between an empiricist reductionism on the one hand and a rationalist relativism on the other. But the way of reassertion of philosophy's irreducible splendor and unifying role, even in the heart of the contemporary academy, comes in part through the reassertion of philosophy's capacity to seek God and to speak rationally and truthfully about God. It is this that gives ultimate light to the unity of all natural learning, and in this task, the multi multiform reflections of Thomas Aquinas on the analogical naming of God are of an inestimable, uh, an inestimable resource they are one even today of perennial value. Thank you very much.